Good morning. Good morning, good morning, church. Good morning, Kilmore. What a beautiful day the Lord has given us. Oh, we should be having service outside today, probably. We have enough folding chairs, we could just move out. Well, it's good to see you here today in the house of the Lord. And what announcements do we have? after church mission committee meeting right up here it's socially distanced wear your mask but any other announcements I, I have one about our charge conference okay I had announced for several weeks that the charge because this is what I read online the charge conference was going to be Sunday the 15th at 6 30 it is now Monday the 16th at 6 30 p.m. And uh, they want us to, it's going to be online, like a Zoom conference. Some of you have already participated in that. And they want us to have four people, uh, four lay people. And so uh, if anyone is able to do that, I don't know if, it, if there's anyone here today that is willing to do that, maybe raise your hand. Okay, thanks, Mary Jo. Um, thanks, Dinah. I think uh, Jim and Jan Need will probably do that. So um, we will get the information. There will be sign-in information that you have to use just like any Zoom meeting, and we'll get that to you. And so uh, we can have enough people to have a, a charge conference, and um, we'll get that done next Monday, a week from tomorrow. Yes. Uh, we're going to have a visiting missionary here next week. Her name is uh, Christina Sim. She is one of the missionaries that we supported last year. She has been stationed in Thailand, and she's no longer there. has been there for over a year. But she wanted to come to speak, and so I said, sure. So next week she'll be here. That'll be interesting. Yeah, very good. Next week. Any other announcements? Anything else going on? It's been brought to my attention that we probably should not do the Christmas cards up here because of the congestion of people putting them in and taking them out. And so maybe um, we should just mail them if you want to mail them or just say Merry Christmas to everybody. But I, I felt like that was probably something we should address. That's true. That's something we need to think about. Uh, actual. That was a meeting, but that was a lot of decisions. Good morning. Um, yeah, the Christmas cards. We always put the boxes out here, and it does lead to a lot of gathering. We probably shouldn't do that. I don't know if there's a better way to do it, but there's got to be a way to social gather, and maybe we do need to use the U.S. Postal Service this year uh, to do that. But unless someone can figure it out and have a better idea for us. Uh, wasn't that Shereem? She's leaving. Do you want to check on her? She's okay. She forgot something. She okay. Oh. Okay. Good morning. Um, other announcements? If anyone has any ideas about the Christmas cards, please make it known. Uh, but we don't know what to do. We don't know what we're doing here. So. <laughs> At least I'm honest. Okay, if there are no other announcements, let's begin our time of worship. Uh, we have a responsive reading in our hymnals. It's kind of a variation of the Apostles' Creed. It's on page 885. 885. It's called a modern affirmation. Let's stand as we're able and let's read this together. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. 
We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God and man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives. We are, we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Amen. And our opening prayer is uh, number 570. 570 in your hymnal. It's the prayer of Ignatius of Loyola. 570. Let us pray together. Teach us, good Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not count to cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for any reward, except that of knowing that we do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 203. 203, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. say hello, good morning to the people around you. Our next hymn is number 569, 569. 
Um, we're singing verses 1, 2, and 4. 5, 6, 9. seated. Our prayer hymn is number 580. Lead on, O King Eternal. 580. share together as the people of God for that's who we are the people of God called by his name called from the dark delivered from shame one holy race saints everyone because of the blood of Jesus the son remember those words you heard those last week if you were here this is our time to approach the throne of our father in heaven the most holy of holies and we can do that 
We who are sinners, we can do that because of the blood of Christ. And so we share together as the people. We lift each other's burdens and we share each other's joys. So I ask you, church, what are your joys today? Do you have any joy? No joy on a beautiful day like this. Indian summer in all its glory. The trees ablaze. The harvest is happening. There is no joy in Kilmore. Kathy? <laughs> what a beautiful day. And yesterday, we had not seen our grandchildren. They had either been quarantined or um, they just couldn't get over. Someone in their dad's family was quarantined. So yesterday afternoon, we went and got our grandchildren. We had a cookout last night. They went out. We took them to Matt and Megan's and they played with their cousins. And it was just a nice day. What a good time. Yes. Family time is good time. It is. It is. Yes, it is. Oh, there's some hands. Kim? They came up to me Friday at work and told me that I got in a perfect attendance award. Well, wonderful. Congratulations. That's a good thing. Yeah. I'm very happy for the... Mary Jo? We, too, had a joy of having family time. Our youngest daughter, Eliana, had her first birthday party yesterday morning, and everybody wore their mask. <laughs> so... Uh, she enjoyed it, and then because it was such a beautiful day, um, they ended up coming over to our house in the evening and going on walks. And That's good. It was really a good day. We had our grand. Got too hot. <laughs> we had our grandsons on Saturday, so it seemed like it was a family weekend. Other joys. Have you seen Christ working? Have you seen any healing? No. Barbara. Uh, Carolyn and Susan. My sister-in-law and niece, they're both on the mend. Theirs was more uh, in the stomach and intestines than it was in the, they didn't have anything in the lungs. But they're still taking it easy and staying inside and saving from people. Uh, Floyd, the other person, is not doing well at all. So keep your hands in prayers. Okay, she shared that Carolyn and Susan, Carolyn's daughter, are doing better. We've been praying for them. Um, they had the COVID, and they are getting better. And Floyd Oaks, a gentleman from Rossville, is near the end of his life, so we need to keep praying for him. Yes. Baby Uriah is doing fine. Uh, they decided that that mask that they saw was just a shadow on her heart. Wonderful. Very good. That's good news. Or it was God. <laughs> yes. And Dad Marcia is feeling better, too. Right? Yeah. Good to see you here today. D yes. Uh, Jill gets to go back to work tomorrow. Good. <clears throat> she finally tested negative yesterday, so she gets to go back. Laura's daughter, Jill, was positive for uh, the coronavirus. So she's less than that or so. Okay, so she's they going... wouldn't let her do anything at home. She said, can I do my stuff at home and send it to you? No. We're going to do that, so. Okay, but she's going back now. Yeah. Good. That's good news. The other day, Calvin Cottrell at Rossville uh -huh. has two broken legs. Calvin Cottrell has two broken legs? He was getting ready to go to bed one night, and he turned around. He has that brittle bone thing, and he, he heard it snap, and he broke a leg, and when he fell, the other one broke. Oh, my goodness. So they took him directly to the hospital and did surgery, so I don't know where he's at now. He's in a nursing home or where he's at. But okay. He's the one that always has a Christmas. Yeah, you may not know. Calvin's the one that put out the amazing Christmas light de decorations every year. So he's a, he's a friend of the church. He may still be out. I don't know this year. So okay. Because the different ones go and put them up for him. So. Thank you for sharing that, Laura. Karen? Um, I got an email from Daylene Marybelle, to be she's Marybelle, it's Mary Lawler. I've known her all my life, so it's Marybelle. Uh, she is under hospice care now. Mary, Mary Lawler is under hospice care. Yeah. She didn't say what the matter was, but she said she's under hospice care. So okay. Thank you, Karen. Yes, Mary Jo? My dad will be 91 on Saturday. He has been bedridden all week. But his sister was able to visit him that hadn't since March. And um, he loves ice cream, so she brought him a little mini blizzard, and that's really been the only thing he's been able to eat. Oh. So, so just ask for prayers for comfort. Prayers for Carl Mays. <laughs> yes, Margie. My eldest granddaughter now has permanent. 
Your oldest granddaughter has COVID? Michelle's daughter. Oh, golly. Which one? Is, is she in Florida or Kentucky? She's in Kentucky, but she does it college. Okay. Yeah. In Kentucky, but she's at college. This weekend, so. well, tell me your name again. Caitlin. Caitlin. We'll pray for Caitlin. Pray protection for her. Absolutely. Barbara? Well, Junior and I are going to have another great grandchild. You're having another great grandchild? We have a son, a great grandson, and now we're going to have a great granddaughter. Well, congratulations. That's wonderful. Good news. Other prayer concerns. Who are we praying for this morning? Our Kim. nation. Our, our nation. Kim? That's what I was going to say. Okay. Peace and unity for, Peace and unity for our nation. Yes. Absolutely. Well, let's go to the Lord. Uh, as we listen to the music, I'll remind you that the first order of business is to confess our sins to our Father in heaven. We, we are sinful people, but because of the blood of Christ, we can come to him. But we are expected to confess our sins. And we do that, and our Father is merciful, and he will forgive us. Let's pray. Precious God, our Heavenly Father, what a beautiful day you have given us. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for this church. It's exciting when we come into this sanctuary where you've met with the saints for so many years. And Lord God, we feel your presence when we come here. And when we gather together as the people of God, as family, there is such joy in that and such comfort. And there is expectation, because when we come together as the people of God, we expect to see great things, and we expect to hear stories of tes and testify uh, about your goodness and what you're doing here on earth. Father, we do apologize. It's so hard for us to say, I'm sorry, sometimes. It's not easy. And yet, when we come before you, we are sorry for our sins. Lord, we understand that sin is an offense against you, not just against each other, but against you. And so, Lord, when we come before you, we want to clear the slate. We are sorry for our sins, and we ask for your forgiveness. And we have great anticipation of receiving your mercy and your grace. And Father, we come to thank you for all the blessings that we enjoy. We are blessed beyond comprehension and with material blessings and spiritual blessings and, and all the freedoms that we enjoy and the families and the friends and new life, family get-togethers. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for our jobs. Thank you for our schools. Thank you for everything that we enjoy. Thank you for our lives. Thank you for salvation through Jesus Christ. And Father, we lift up our prayer concerns to you. We do pray for those who are uh, still suffering in physical uh, need, for those who are sick or going through uh, injuries, accidents, COVID, cancer, any other disease, Lord. We lift ourselves up for the healing power of Jesus Christ. We pray that you would pour out the Holy Spirit with healing on us and our friends, our loved ones, those who are home today that can't be with us. Heal our bodies that we might continue to serve you and proclaim you are a mighty God who hears our prayers and answers them. Father, be with those who are down in spirits and who are just um, suffering in any way, mentally, emotionally. We pray that you would lift us up. Let us... Turn our eyes away from the things of this world and turn on the face of Jesus Christ. Father, we do pray for this church. We pray your blessing on Kilmore United Methodist Church. Help us to be a light in the darkness, a beacon of truth. And, and Lord God, we pray that you would continue to bless this church as you have in the past, that we may continue to prosper and thrive and grow and be influential in our community in building your kingdom here on earth. 
Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for, in a time of transition, we pray for peace and unity. We pray for acceptance. We pray for an end to violence and, and hostility. Lord, we pray that we would remember that we are first and foremost Christians. We pray that we would forget earthly titles. We would cease to be liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, this party, that party, factions, groups, that those are of man. Help us to remember, Lord, that you are in control. You are over all. And that we call ourselves brothers and sisters because we are in Christ. In spite of our political uh, leanings or our differences of opinion, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And anything that is not of love is not of Christ. Help us to remember that, Father. Lord, we pray for all those who are suffering from the COVID-19. We pray your protection on those who have not caught it. We pray for healing for those who have. We pray comfort for the families who have lost loved ones. Father, we cry out to you again. Each week we cry out to you. Your people are crying out to you. Take this plague from our land. Save us from this plague. Father, we... We look forward to the day when this is not an issue, but we also look forward to the day when there is no more crying, no more tears, no more violence, that the peace of Jesus Christ will rule on this earth. May it be so. And now, Father, as the church, as one heart beating together, we pray the prayer that Jesus himself taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And this would normally be our time to pass the place, but because of the pandemic, we're not doing that. So uh, we have put the box in the back with a slot in it. If you are um, leaving, coming, we ask that you be faithful to your church with your tithes and offerings. I ask those who are watching at home, please be faithful to your church. Your churches depend upon your support, your prayer support, uh, your attendance, if that's possible, and your financial support. So thank you for that. In lieu of doing that, let's continue through the tradition of standing and singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, standing for the reading of the gospel please I'm reading today from Matthew's gospel chapter 25 verses 14 through 18 if someone has the page in their pew Bible would you shout it out 1541 1541 if you want to read along I will preface the reading by saying Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God here. He has been describing the kingdom of God. He's trying to describe the indescribable with human words. And so he's telling parables of what the kingdom will be like. And so Matthew records his words here. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. 
May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. I see you're still at the keyboard. Could we sing um, Glory Be to the Father? seated. I was downtown the other day and I saw a guy carrying a Scrabble game and he tripped and dropped it and the letters spilled all over so I walked up to him I said hey what's the word on the street? <laughs> Jesus says again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. He's teaching about the kingdom. And so he's saying that's, this, is a, this is a little picture of the kingdom of God. How can I describe it? Could you describe it? Jesus, who knew what he was talking about, Jesus, who had come from there, is trying to describe this. And so he's telling these parables. If, you, if you'll remember, a parable is an earthly story with a spiritual lesson. It teaches us something. And in this case, he's teaching us about the kingdom of God. It reminds me of the first chapter of the book of Acts. When Jesus was ready to ascend to heaven, he had lived, he had died, he had risen from the dead, and he had been with his disciples for a while, and then he was ready to ascend and go back to be at the right hand of God the Father. And so he was going on a journey, and before he left, he promised the Holy Spirit, the gift. He gave that. And so this says, there is a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. I think that's probably the analogy we look at there. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. <coughs> Jesus was looking for faithfulness. He's still looking for faithful men and women to serve him. This master is calling his servants to entrust property, property to them. Paul also wrote, for the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. He's calling his servants together, knowing them. The master knows his servants. He's employed them, they've worked for him, he's watched them, and he knows who is trustworthy and who is faithful, and he knows who is not. He knows who is gifted, who can do many things, uh, and he knows the ones who are better off if you just give them one thing at a time. So it says, he gave to one five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Now, I want to look at that word talent. The word talent comes to us in English directly from the Latin, which came from Greek. The New Testament is written in Greek. The word talent was a, a measure of weight, like we might say ton. And it came to mean a measure of weight of money. A talent of gold was a tremendous amount of money. We don't know how much. I've seen very things uh, in print. I've seen uh, writers, scholars that, that say, well, it was probably equal to a year's wages. So what's a year of your wages? I, you know, that depends on the person. It doesn't really matter to the story what the monetary value is. A talent in this story comes to represent a lot of money. It's a significant amount of money. Okay? It's not just a handful of coins. And when you look up this word talent in the dictionary, after it gives the word and it gives how to pronounce it, it gives the etymology. That means what the word means, where it came from, the history of the word. 
And the word talent, if you read that, it will say, refer to the parable in Matthew 25, 14 through 18. It actually sends you to this story to learn the meaning of talent. Because you see, it went from meaning a great deal of money from the way it's used in this story, it became, in the, clear back in the Middle Ages, it became synonymous with gifts. A talent was a gift from God. Something that you were given to use for the glory of God to build His kingdom. And so it might be, the way we use talents today is we talk about a person has a certain talent for something. You might have a talent for uh, knitting and crocheting. You might have a talent for music. You might have a talent for cooking and and baking. You might have a talent for hospitality. People have all different kinds of talents. A talent in this story represents something you've been given by God and it is to be used for the glory of God and to build God's kingdom. Okay? Jesus said, I am a good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. This man knows his servants. He entrusts them with talents. Then he goes on his journey. Now the man who received five talents put them to work. It says he put them to work at once and gained five more. But it doesn't tell us what he did with it. He put his, his money to work. Well, that's interesting. Is money meant to be put to work? Well, it can be. You can put money to work. I say that's the way to wealth. Let your, let your money work for you. Let your money accumulate more money. It doesn't tell us what he did in this story. We don't know how he put his money to work. He might have gone to his Edward Jones agent. He might have gone down to the bank and bought CDs. He might have started a Chick-fil-A franchise. We don't know what he did with his money. Okay. But he did something, and that, that brings up the question, what would we do today? If someone were to entrust you with a great amount of money and said, I'm coming back in a couple years. I want to see what you've done with this. What would they find? You have a new house, a new pickup truck, a motorcycle and a boat? <laughs> I mean, how would you increase? Would you invest in real estate? Would you put it in the bank? Would you start a business? How would you increase that money? Now, we don't know, and it doesn't really matter. It, we're, that's not the point of the story, what they did. But what's interesting is they were able to double the money. The story reflects the real life experience that some people do have more talents than others. That's just the way it is. There are people that are extremely good at a number of things. We've known there are people that are good at sports and at the same time they're good singers. They're gifted in the classroom. They're scholars, honorable. Uh, others, maybe not so much. And that's just the way we are as people. It's not a judgment call, it's just recognizing the reality that some people have more talent than others. It doesn't mean that God loves them more. Maybe it means that they have demonstrated that they are capable of handling it. The man with the five talents, he put his money to work, he doubled it. The same as the one with two talents. But the third man, you see, stories frequently go in threes. The three bears, the three pigs, the three, you know. This story is no exception. The first man, five talents, doubles it. The second man, two talents, doubles it. But then we get to the point of the story. We get to the reason we're telling this story. Because the third man was maybe not as uh, talented as the other. He was, giving one, he was given one talent. And what did he do with it? He dug a hole and buried it. He hid it. And so when the master came back, the man with the five talents said, Here, I brought you your five talents, and oh, by the way, I made five more. The master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. That's what we all want to hear when we meet Jesus. I imagine 
This, I think about it like this. Someday we will close our eyes to this world and open them up and see Jesus. And what we hope to hear is, well done, good and faithful servant. That comes right out of this story. Come and share your master's happiness. You have done well. You see, it's said that after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts for them. The master in this story is Jesus. He goes away when he ascends to heaven. Is he going to come back? Well, he is. The second coming, when Jesus comes back again, and what will happen then? The final judgment. He will settle accounts with his servants. There will be a reckoning. And we have to account for our lives. It says that in Revelation. And so Jesus is going to say, what did you do with the talents I gave you? What did you do with the gifts I gave you? And it could be talents like musical talent, like we talked about. The talent to speak, the talent to write, the talent to lead children, that, anything like that. But also, there is another gift that we've received from our Heavenly Father. This book, the Gospels, the Scripture. Jesus will want an accounting. What did you do with the Scripture? that God gave you. Did you just put it on the shelf? I don't expect you dug a hole and buried it, but did you do the same thing in a sense by just putting it up on the shelf and never opening it up? Put it on the coffee table in plain view, but never, never opened it? Wiped the dust off of it? What, what did you do with that? What, what did you do with your knowledge of the kingdom of God? What have you done with that? You see, there will, there will be an accounting. There will be a judgment. The first man did well. And so, metaphorically, as the story goes, here's the five talents you gave me, and by the way, here's five more. What could that be? I led five people. I, I told five more people about the kingdom. And, and they listened, and they started attending services, and they gave their lives to Jesus Christ. I, I told people, I, I gave away Bibles. I just bought them and took them out and gave them to people, and some of those people actually read them, and it changed their life. I, I took this story, you know the story right after this one? It's the sheep and the goats, where Jesus said... I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. I needed clothes. You clothed me. I was sick. You yeah, I took those talents you gave me, Lord, and I went out and, and I gave food to people that were hungry and water to people that were... I, I helped dig a well. I, I paid for a well to be dug over in Africa somewhere. They didn't have clean water. I took those talents you gave me, Lord, and I, I got clothing to people. I advanced your kingdom. You see, that's, you don't have to be a preacher to advance the kingdom. Every one of us can do that by how we live. Someone said one time, preach a sermon every day. Use words if you absolutely have to. The way we live our lives is a sermon. We show other people what it means to be citizens of the kingdom. People should be able to look at us and go, there's something different about that person. They're not like everyone else. There's a peace about them and, and a love. And I always feel comfortable with them. I don't feel threatened by them. They don't judge me. That's what it means to build the kingdom. And that's what this is about. Two people passed the test, but the third man, mm, here comes the point of the story. We've had two good examples, now here's the bad example. Have you ever worked with a disgruntled employee? <laughs> Your laughter, yeah, many of us have. It's, it's not fun, is it? When you hear complaints all day against the business, against the boss, just drives you crazy. I kind of think this third man, this third servant might have been like that. He wasn't happy. As soon as the master comes back and calls him in, he does what's called a preemptive strike. He knows he's about to be repri reprimanded, so he goes on the attack. 
And I know there's a saying in sports, the best defense is a good offense. As long as you score in points, don't worry about what the other team does. Just stay on the charge. Just keep scoring. The Purdue had a basketball coach one time when Rick Mount played there back in those days. If you scored 100 points, they'd score 110. The best defense is a go. Go on the attack. Always on the attack. That seems to work in sports and politics, but it certainly doesn't work in a master-servant relationship. The master comes back and this guy goes on the attack. Listen to what he said. He said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you had not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. That's, that's an old saying, a very old saying, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seeds. So I was afraid and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here's what he made himself the victim right away. Before his master can say anything, he attacks him, he attacks his character. And remember what Jesus said, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. This master was very good with the first two people. And before he gets a chance to say anything, the third guy attacks his character. He's on the defensive by and he's and he's responding by attacking. I was afraid. I'm the victim. I was afraid of what you might do. Well, he knows he did wrong. He, he was lazy. He didn't make any effort. So, what his master says is, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. You could have at least done that, you lazy bum. But you didn't. And now you're claiming you're the victim. You're afraid. That's why you did it. Uh, now, this story isn't meant, if Jesus is the master, it's not meant to depict him as the hard man who, who harvests where he is not sown. That's not Jesus at all. We know that. But this man doesn't, this third man doesn't know his master. Are there people that don't know Jesus? Are there people that have the wrong impression of Jesus? You know, I learned a long time ago when somebody will say to me, I can't believe in a God that would do such and such. My answer is, I don't believe in that God either. That's not the God I believe in. So you have a misunderstanding of who Jesus Christ really is. Let me help you with that. This third man did not know his master. And so he gets all defensive and, and he's, he's making himself the victim. The master said, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. That's, that's, that, that's that very thing that Paul wrote about. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 47 and 48. The servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. What's the point of that? It if you know better, if you know what your master wants, if you know what God wants of you, if you've heard the gospel stories, if you know about Jesus, if Jesus has ever knocked on your door, and you know better, and you disobey, and you continue to sin, you will be punished. You will be held accountable. If you don't know any better, and I think there are people that have never heard the story. It's hard to imagine, but even in this country, I think there are people that have never heard these stories. They've never been inside a church, never been told the stories, never heard about Jesus. I think it's quite possible that they don't know any better. And, and what the Scripture is saying is, they won't be punished to the extent that someone who knew better. This third man, he worked for this master, he was around him, but he didn't know him.
He should have known better. And so he is severely punished. In the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, we are not to hide our talents. And that's the point of the story. When you're given something, you're to use it. God told the first human beings, go out and scatter and multiply. It's in Genesis 1, it's in Genesis 8, I think it's in Genesis 11. Go out and cover the earth, spread over the earth, multiply. Don't just sit in your little group. Cheryl's BSF group just studied the Tower of Babel story, which I always struggled with. I never could understand why it was so bad to build a tower. And I think we arrived at an understanding that what those people were doing, they had been told by God to go out and scatter and spread the, the story of God. And they didn't do that. They built themselves a city with a tower for their own glory so everybody would come and uh, be amazed by them. And God said, uh-uh, no, we're not doing this. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll confound your languages so you can't do this again. I think the point is we're not supposed to isolate ourselves. If you've been given a gift... Church, have you ever received a gift from God? If you've been given any gifts, is there anyone here that has a gift, a gift from God? Have you used it for the glory of God and to advance His kingdom? That's the point of the story. We're to use our gifts, whatever they are. I... I played guitar for a long time, since high school, and I had a, an old guitar that was falling apart, and, and I wanted a new one, <clears throat> and didn't want to spend the money, but we talked about it, and, and I prayed, and I told God, I will use this for your glory. If you'll allow me to do this, and if it'll be all right, God, that we get a nice guitar, I will use it for your glory. And I started leading worship on Emmaus walks and with the FCA and in church and everywhere we went. We used to go around churches and I'd play guitar and we'd sing and entertain social gatherings. <clears throat> I, I made that promise to God. I will use it for your glory. God gave me that gift of music. He didn't do that just for my own benefit. He did it so I could use it for Him. And, and what is your gift? I know you have gifts. We all have gifts. The Bible talks about the spiritual gifts. But we all have talents. Are you using it? Are you using your talent to help build up the church? Keep it going. Are you using your talent to build up your community, your city? Are we building the kingdom of God? or are we? Just... There's an old question. Are you standing on the promises or are you just sitting on the premises? <clears throat> That's what this story is about. We are all given gifts and graces, talents that are to be used. Seek out the unbelievers. Invite them to church. And for the church itself, never be content just to meet on Sunday morning and say, oh, wow, we had a, had a good crowd today. Music was pretty good. Sermon was okay. Wasn't his best one, but it was okay. <laughs> so I feel good. I can start my week out feeling good. But we're not doing anything to help the community. You know, I've said for years, if we, if we close and put a lock on the door and nobody noticed, what have we accomplished? What's the point of even being here? We're here to make a difference. The mission statement of the United Methodist Church is go and make disciples for the transformation of the world. We're supposed to be affecting the world, are we? We better. <laughs> we better if we want to hear, come my good and faithful servant. Come and join your master's happiness. We better be doing that. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your stories. Thank you for these parables of Jesus. Thank you for what they teach us. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, the, the incredible opportunity to be your servants and to work for you and for the kingdom. 
And Father, we give you all praise and all glory today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song. This is a song of submitting to God. Have thine own way. It's number 382. It's saying, use me, Lord. Put me to work. 382. Verses 1 through 3. before the pandemic I would walk out and greet everyone and we would wait in line but we're not doing that we have to keep social distance so I would re remind you as you dismiss today please observe social distancing so we can all stay healthy amen now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you now and for always amen, amen. let's sing the last verse of have thine own way